How do substations get their power and still keep running even when the grid goes down? Do they just plug in to the transformer and get free electricity? Well, sort of. Let's take a look. First, let's go back in time. When the supergrid was first built by the CEGB and before that the BEA and CEA, the national grid and power generation were owned by the government. So it made sense that the substations could use power essentially for free in service of supplying the country. But how did they actually get the power? Transmission substations operate at 132, 275 or 400 kV in the UK. Inside a substation, a supergrid transformer or SGT steps that voltage down to distribution levels, usually 33, 66 or 132 kV. For example, you might have a primary winding at 275 kV and a secondary winding at 66 kV. But transformers can have a third winding too, known as a tertiary winding. That third winding isn't just for show. It can help with fault currents, harmonic suppression and connecting equipment like reactors and capacitors for voltage support. And importantly, that tertiary winding can also connect to an auxiliary transformer, providing low voltage power directly to the substation. This auxiliary transformer might deliver 400 volts straight to the substation or 11 kV out to a local distribution substation. By the way, if you missed my last video about transformers and how they fail, check it out. I included some animations showing how windings work. Fast forward to today and things have changed. The national grid is now privatised and auxiliary transformers are metered, meaning all power used is paid for. But here's the challenge. Many of the old coal and gas plants have shut down and some substations built on those sites didn't have a connection to the distribution network. Without the original SGTs, those substations could be powerless unless a brand new DNO connection is installed. Which brings us nicely on to our second way substations get their power today. The DNO, or Distribution Network Operator, provides a new connection from the local grid. Typically it can be 11 kV into a local transformer and 400 volts free phase out to supply the LVAC board and other equipment. And don't worry, substations don't use a lot of power, it's modest compared to the rest of the grid. The most important systems that need power are the switchgear, control panels and protection panels. Switchgear needs power to move motors, open and close disconnectors and charge breaker mechanisms. Control panels handle remote operation and alarms, and protection panels trip circuit breakers if things go wrong. All the power feeds into the LVAC board, which is the low voltage AC board. Inside, you'll find low voltage breakers, control systems, and often a device called an ATS, or automatic transfer switch, which can automatically flip to back up if the main power supply fails. But what if both supplies fail? What happens then? That's where the diesel generators come in. Every substation has a backup diesel generator with its own nickel cadmium battery, used for starting the generator and enough fuel to last through an outage. Nickel cadmium batteries are preferred because it handles temperature swings better and it lasts longer than other types of battery, like lithium ion. Plus, they're less prone to thermal runaway compared to lithium batteries. Generators are usually rated up to 2 NVA, and some remote substations have multiple units for redundancy. And in case the main generator fails, there's even a hookup point for connecting a portable generator in an emergency. The generators usually look like big shipping containers, but with exhaust stacks, air intakes, and often fire suppression systems that won't activate if someone's inside. What about battery backups? Why not just use big batteries instead? Well, substations do have batteries, but not like a full BESS or grid scale storage system. They use centralised or distributed battery banks to supply DC power for critical systems. If it's a central system, you'll find two sets of 2 volt wet cells wired together to make 110 volts DC. Each set usually has 55 cells making up one battery, and there'll be two batteries for redundancy. There's also two chargers and two inverters, one main and one backup for redundancy. Fun fact, wet cells give off hydrogen gas when charging, 
which is explosive. Which is why newer substations are moving towards gel type batteries which produce far less hydrogen when charging. Some substations have distributed batteries which use VRLA or valve regulated lead acid batteries which are sealed and maintenance free and usually 12 volts each meaning less are needed. They have other benefits and drawbacks which we'll explore in a dedicated batteries or DC systems video. Examples of battery system requirements include national grid electricity distributions, engineering equipment specification 24.4 which states under battery duty cycle, the battery system shall, in the event of a failure of either the charger or its AC supply, be capable of supporting the standing DC load for a period of 72 hours, followed by the opening or tripping of a single circuit breaker. Which put simply, even if the grid goes down for three whole days, we still need the protection systems to work. SSEN makes reference to a similar 72 hour standing load. Before we cover the last backup option, leave a comment. How do you think substations could become more self-sufficient and resilient? So what about solar power? Can't we just put solar panels on every substation? Unfortunately, most substations have really small roofs and old buildings that can't support much solar. But as we build new substations, we're starting to see solar installations happen. For example, at Viking Link, two converter halls managed to fit two 50 kilowatt solar arrays. That's enough to sometimes export back to the local DNO. However, converter stations have huge energy needs, like cooling banks and air handling units that run 24 7, which is far higher than a typical substation. So that was a quick and simple topic to cover that I hope filled in some gaps in your knowledge. In future videos, I'll dive deeper into DC systems, auxiliary transformers and how the grid handles a black start situation. Thanks for watching, remember to like, comment and subscribe to help this information reach more people, it really boosts the channel and keeps me motivated too. Thanks.